I grew up in Southwest Virginia. Radford was a town. Came from a musical family. Um, mom and dad both played, but when they started a family of five, they put that aside. So I can blame the music on my brother, Ricky, <laughs> or credit him with it. Um, he was the, the middle child, and he would get up and watch this show that was broadcast out of Roanoke, Virginia, WDBJ. Uh, Don Reno and Red Smiley. It was called Top of the Morning. And he would literally take two pieces of kindling, and like he was playing the fiddle while the show was on the whole time. <laughs> And my folks said, we need to get him a fiddle for Christmas. So they did. And so that got the music sparked back in the family. And we would do picnics and get togethers and that kind of thing till my dad passed away. And then it continued on. My younger sister, she started playing. And we started doing uh, fiddler's conventions. That was big where we grew up. So. Late at night's the time you hear me say. Once again. My dad played banjo and my, my mom sang old country stuff like Blue Sky Boys, Bale's Brothers, so that sort of ballady kind of stuff. So I had that around as a kid, but then when I got into, just, be, just, just before my teens, I got into listening to the music of whatever my peers were listening to, Beatles, Rolling Stones, and Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, people like that. But always the back of my mind was this, you know, was this more rural type music and and I later got into uh, you know Bob Dylan and John Prine and the sort of early singer songwriter things Joni Mitchell and James Taylor and after that it was almost like I never felt like I really left that rock and roll pop music it more left me because when the disco thing came in I had nothing in common with it I didn't enjoy it and and so I started searching at that point and you know, discovered Hank Williams and Jimmy Rogers and people like that. And no, actually, I started out uh, playing mandolin. That kind of forced it on me. I, I didn't have an interest in it, but uh, so we would do the fiddlers conventions, and uh, after that kind of fizzled out, we got together, my brother Ricky, with uh, a couple other local musicians, and played a band called Upland Express. And we traveled out even further and played like in Tennessee and North Carolina, Virginia. And then out of the blue, I, I got a phone call from uh, a guy that owned a music store. My mother did not like this phone call, but they were looking for a bass player for the Bluegrass Cardinals. And uh, I finally made the contact with JC and he said, won't you come on down? And, and I did. And uh, uh, the Cardinals were looking for a bass player just for the weekend. They had a, a change in bass players. And uh, that turned out to be like a year and a half. But but the, what really got me was was the Stanley brothers, it's particularly Carter Stanley. And um, in 1973, I went to, uh, me and some friends from high school went down to McClure, Virginia, to the old Stanley home place. And that was almost like, it became like a religious experience for me. You know, first of all, it's way out in the middle of nowhere. And, and I remember being on this dirt road, going up at these cur curvy mountain roads, then there's no way that there's a public event being held back here. And, but you know, we got up the top of this Smith Ridge, I guess, is, that's where they're from, and that's where they held this festival, and still do for that matter. And uh, you know, there's a little row of, a uh, little string of these, these yellow uh, lights that you'd see at like carnival grounds or something strung up in this, old fella in bib overalls at a ticket booth, and it was like I'd gone back in time. And, and we pulled in the gate, and up through this, this mountain holler come Man of Constant Sorrow, Ralph on stage singing it solo. And I just, that was it for me. I mean, I'm, and I'm never, it, I mean, it still gives me the goosebumps just thinking about what that felt like. Because it, it was, uh, I had by this time had, not only listened to a lot of bluegrass, I started reading about it, and I kind of like the whole cultural thing about it too. You know, that you know that it came from such had deep roots, and and um, you know I like the whole thing, not just the not just the music, but the whole cultural aspects of it.
-hmm. As far as actual bluegrass music, uh, I was actually introduced to bluegrass music by the Seldom Scene in uh, about 1981. And I went to a, a concert at the Warner Theater in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I was interested in slide cause, because I think because of the pedal steel guys back in the day of my dad's tavern and in the 70s listening to Dwayne Allman and all those guys play, I was really interested in bottleneck slide or just any kind of slide, really. And so <clears throat> at the time, Merle was playing, Merle Watson and Doc were playing, and, and Merle played a little bit of slide on his acoustic guitar. So I kind of went to the concert that night to hear those guys play, and, uh, and uh, the seldom seen was the opening act, whom I'd never seen before. And when they came out and struck the first note, I thought, man, this is really cool. I like these guys. And I'm not sure what that guy over there named Mike Aldridge is playing, but I really like that because that was a combination of acoustic music and steel guitar slide is kind of what I was looking for. So after that, I kind of pursued it. So I ended up, I ended up uh, just spending all my time in my room listening to records and reading and trying to learn to play. And I met another fellow, his name was Ron Welch, and he was just as obsessed about it, at least initially, as I was. And he played guitar and sang lead, and I played banjo and sang tenor. And we did that for a while until uh, I literally ran him off because I just I was just such a jerk. I mean, I was just it's all I cared about. And and uh, and he eventually thought, you know, this is a little too heavy for me. And and so he left. So here I was, a tenor singer banjo player, with no gig. And there was this little bar down the street called Shakey's Pizza, and they had uh, they had bluegrass on every Wednesday night. And Ben and Valley Kane, who Tom had mentioned earlier, they were playing there every Wednesday, and we'd kind of gotten to befriend them, you know. And they'd get us up during their breaks, and we'd play for ten or fifteen minutes, and and you know, and I, that was my first taste of actually being on the stage, and I really really liked that. <laughs> and. Uh, and after Ron left, I went in the next Wednesday night and I was telling Valley Kane that, you know, how, you know, oh, woe is me, you know, I guess my career is over before it starts and I don't have any gig. And she said, well, you know what, I'll never forget it. She said, you know what, you're, you're banjo playing, you're, you're probably never going to be a great banjo player, but, but you're a pretty good singer. And, and she said, if I, if I could give you any advice, it would be to learn to play guitar and, and concentrate more on your singing and let the banjo go. And so that's what I did. Well, <clears throat> uh, the next day I went home and I had an old Sears Silver, actually it was my brother's, so I don't even know what, how, what year it was, a Sears Silvertone guitar up in the attic or whatever, and I took it out and raised this, put a bolt underneath the end of it and raised the strings up on the neck and, and started playing, found an old Stevens bar or laying around the house and started playing slide. And uh, then I bought, every Mike Aldridge seldom seen record I could find and happened to live close enough to the Birchmere back in those days where I could go practically every other Thursday night and sometimes every Thursday night. After about a year of playing, um, I got married in 1982 to my wife Kyle and uh, for a wedding present she gave me a lesson with Mike Aldridge. That was my wedding present and uh, I was just astounded. I mean because you know I held those guys, all of them, you know Ben and Tom and John and all of them in such high regard. I was like how did you get his phone number? And she said, well, I looked in the phone book. That's what I did, you know? And I was like, yeah, Mike Aldridge's phone number is certainly not in the phone book. And she said, yes, it was. So ended up, ended up we did a lesson, and we became friends. And I think he kind of sort of admired that I sort of played similar to him. And he enjoyed giving me a lesson because he could tell me something, and I could kind of understand what he was talking about. And so we did a number of those over the next few years. So that's pretty much how I got started. Well, I, I tell a tell us tell a story. I, I have a story yeah. for you. Is is like I like I mentioned earlier. You know, we were we were all we'd known Duffy for a long time. All of us did. You know, through other bands, but to actually spend a lot of time with him, I think I could honestly say from all of our standpoints, we've not spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Duffy. So we were all just a little bit intimidated by his larger-than-life persona. And it, what a legacy, you know, a legacy act. I mean, such an important group. Um, I guess I could go ahead and tell this story. Is it saw this uh, little blurb in Bluegrass Unlimited magazine, which is the closest thing we have to a trade journal. And it said something about the seldom seen dissolving. And so I called John, and I said, uh, 
John, what's up? You know, this is terrible. It's almost like I called to express my condolences because it's almost like a death in the family because being the seldom seen is kind of like a Washington institution. And so I called John to tell him how sorry I was to hear about it. And he said, well, we're not really dissolving the band. We're just looking for a guitar player, lead singer, baritone singer, dobro player, <laughs> you know, bass player, bass singer, and, you know, bus and a yeah, bus driver. And he's just kind of, you know, kind of making fun of the whole thing. And, and I, I don't know what made me say it, but I said, well, John, we ought to get together and sing sometime. And it was just total silence on the other end of the line. And I thought, oh man, I've stepped over some kind of line here that I didn't know existed. And uh, he said, well, he said, do you know any of and you know any of my stuff? And I said, well, you know, not really, but you know, we all have heard it for years. So uh, we we were going to try to get together, and because of everybody's touring schedules, we couldn't do it until August. But that's what we started uh, rehearsing. It was an audition slash rehearsal. So we were all a little nervous, and, and so we, we had a set time to get over to John's place over in Arlington, and I went over about a half an hour early because I didn't want to get caught in traffic and be late to my rehearsal or audition. And so I drove to a church parking lot, which I sort of thought would probably be about two blocks from John, and I was a half an hour early, so I didn't want to go over that early. So, you know, every like 10 or 15 minutes, I, I pulled my car up another block to make sure I was close enough that I could get there on time. And while I'm doing this, I noticed that there was a car coming the other direction. And it was Ronnie. So we were all sort of converging, just hitching their way, just hitching their way to Duffy's house. Nobody wanted to be the first one in the door. That's right. When, when we, when, because Fred and I had met, and Ronnie and I had actually spent a lot of time together back in the 80s, but uh, we started calling each other every week or so, saying, have you heard anything? <laughs> you know, have they made any kind of decision yet? And I think that's probably what another thing that kind of got us excited about the idea of, my God, we could play together. This would be really fun, you know? I don't think we were really on trial. I think we were already kind of selected. It was just a matter of getting together and seeing if it would work. <laughs> <laughs>